this is going to be a pragmatic panel. We're going to talk about what has to be done, what has to be done now, and what we're going to, as best we can, demand that the G20 address. So without further ado, I'd like to bring in the other members of the panel. We'll start with His Excellency, the Minister of Agriculture, Republic of Indonesia, Mr. Uh, or, or His Excellency, Sirahu Yasin Limpo. Mr. Minister, welcome. Please. Um, next will be um, Ambassador David Merrill, former U.S. Ambassador to Indonesia, long career in the U.S. Agency of International Development. Next, please. Next will be the Honorable Kira Rudik, who is the Vice President of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe, People's Deputy of Ukraine. Welcome, Kira. And on the screen with us, we should have, yes, we have Dr. Seth Meyer, the Chief Economist, the probably one of the most foremost experts in the world on agricultural economics and technology. And Seth, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you. I'm sorry you're not here in person. And we're looking at you continuously, but don't let that make you nervous. We're going to watch you the whole time. Okay, let's get right to it. So I want to start with um, the deputy from Ukraine. And Kira, I want to ask you this. You know, we're talking about this being a crisis. So we're in a crisis. This war is not over. Of course, you, we're happy that Ukraine has recovered Kyrgyzstan. But uh, we don't know what's going to happen next. So the odds are that we're going to have another disrupted, disrupted planting season in Ukraine, and Ukraine's one of the bed baskets. What can you tell us that we should ask the world to do for the farmers of Ukraine right now to give us the greatest output of grain for the world? Hello, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure being here. So when we are talking about uh, the next harvest season, and how to make sure that we prepare for it the best and most effective way, we should look at it as a, with a business approach. So in business, when you are in crisis, the first thing is you need to fixate the losses. So right now, we need to make sure that there is no more destruction, or at least it minimized. So for that, we need Air Force protection systems, and we are asking our allies, United States, European countries, United Kingdom, all countries from all over the world to provide us with Air Force protection systems to protect infrastructure from further destruction. This is the first one. Second one is, of course, demining. The demining efforts need to happen right now. They are happening, but at a very small scale, uh, because basically all the lands that are supposed to be agricultural lands right now partially or fully are mined and they are uh, not going to be able to be used um, uh, to plant the harvest. Third thing, of course, we need to fix infrastructure and use these five months uh, before the next uh, planting season to fix the infrastructure. As of right now, 40% of energy infrastructure in Ukraine is destroyed. So when the cities are experiencing electrical outages, when there is no running water, it would be very hard to continue on the commitment that we have uh, in terms of the agriculture. So we need from the international community support on going through the winter and also fixing the infrastructure. Fourth thing is commitment on the fuel. We understand that right now uh, Ukraine is purchasing fuel and this is of course has an impact on the price of the uh, harvest, on the grains, on all the products. So we need to make plans and commitments for the next year for the fuel and for the prices of it. And of course, it's a painful subject for everybody. And the last but not the least and the critically important point is the grain deal. The grain deal is a temporary agreement between the United Nations, Ukraine, Russia and Turkey that the ports where the grains are exported from are being... Um, not neutral, but the ships can go in and out easily. So the price of the harvest depends on the price of the insurance that the companies have to put on the ships, 
that are going in and out uh, of the war zone, basically. So having a written commitment or the general commitment so it will seem safely or look safely or be more safe for the companies to ship the grains in and out Ukraine would decrease the price of insurance and the price of transportation. As, of, um, as for Ukrainian people, we want the war to be over. We are a technological and agricultural country. We want to make sure that we continue being a breadbasket for the whole world. This is one of our missions. This is what we want to do. And I can tell you, part of my family uh, are farmers. It's sacred, it's almost religious for us to be able to provide life, to create life instead of death. And this is critically important, and this is why we are fighting so hard to win the war, to end the war, and to make sure that we return to the safe operation where we are able to build the prosperity for everyone and contradict all the crises. Kira, thank you very much. You've given us some very clear guidelines, and we'll make sure those get reflected in what we pass on uh, to the White House and also to the, uh, to the G20 here. And I'd like to turn next to uh, Minister Limpo. Minister, General Proboa gave us this incredible presentation today that shows this progress that's been made in Indonesia. There must be many countries all over the world who look at the example of Indonesia and say, we could do this, we would like to do this. I know we have representatives here from several African countries, and I'm sure they're, uh, they'll be anxious to listen to your experience and, um, and your guidelines on how was this accomplished. The, the rice, the, the, the palm oil, the technology with cassava, how was this done? What is Indonesia doing that's bringing it to the forefront in this way. Oh, yeah. Thank you, General. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Distinguished resource persons, ladies and gentlemen, from discussions which we have had, and for the last one year, we have heard the huge challenges and issues that we are facing concerning climate change, wars, and also the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. We have talked about this in many forums. And talking about food, food is the most strategic issue. And this issue requires the attention of states, nations, and the global citizens, as well as peace and public order. We might be able to delay other issues, but we can't delay the issue of food food issue is the most essential, the most fundamental, that it has multidimensional aspects. Therefore, our president, Mr. Joko Widodo, has determined that food is a top priority, and it shall be discussed in detail. In our countries, we look at our provinces, regencies, and sub-regencies, and also the states and then we look at the regions and we divide our areas in Indonesia into production regions into three areas. We are dividing our areas in Indonesia into areas that have surplus in stocks, regions which have limited stocks, and which may get in trouble in crisis if crisis strikes and there are also areas which have shortages likewise in the global level there are countries facing shortages of food and there are also countries having limited stocks and there are also countries having abundant stocks therefore in facing this global crisis the food crisis, what we may do, among others, like what we do in Indonesia, under the leadership of our president, is mitigate and adapt ourselves with issues, including climate change, including the global supply chain and food logistic aspects. This should be anticipated, and proper adaptation 
should be made by all food producers as well. Second of all, subnational cooperation. Subnational cooperation should be promoted and regulated by the state. No subnational region should restrict its trade, fulfilling its own need only, or even close itself because it may affect the trade ecosystem as a whole. And this pattern is the same with the global pattern. We need to look at the flow of food to where it needs. We should look at the flow of supply chain, from which area does it flow. And in Indonesia, we have dealt with food crisis. For the past three years, we have had a surplus in food reserve, especially rice, which we have used to deal with shortages in wheat because there is a pro problem with supply from India, Russia, and Ukraine. Therefore, we must prepare measures to substitute the wheat in the event of wheat shortage issues. So we prepare our sagu, our cassava, and our sorghum to prepare for any shortages. Currently, there is no problem. This year, we are okay. We don't have issues with wheat. But what about next year? What about the regulation? And will the regular shipping of this commodity return to normal? And what if the stocks are concentrated in a particular area? If this happens, what we need to do is to substitute such commodities. We also had issues with cattle, which we have imported 1.2 million cattle. Therefore, in the event of shortage, what we need to do is to prepare our lamb, chicken, and egg supply. What I meant is handling this food crisis is a must. And there is no single country that has an ability to restrict itself because this will result in a global issue. And as for cooperation, in the G20 agricultural ministerial meeting last time in Bali, there were three points. First, promoting the agricultural and food system that is resilient and sustainable, which includes the incorporation of technology, food variety, cooperation, and collaboration in science. Second, promoting open, just, predictable, transparent, non-discriminating traits to ensure affordability and availability of food. Food is human rights, and therefore, there shall be no country in G20 to restrict itself, to restrict its trade, or to protect its internal interest only, because we are part of the global community of G20. And this is what we have agreed upon in the G20 Agricultural Ministerial Meeting. Third of all, we have, a, we have had an agreement that for all countries with the agreement in Washington with, with G20 finance ministers and agricultural ministers, all countries should put food on the top priority. It should be on top. Therefore, when talking about the global context, our mapping on the countries that have issues of food shortages, we need to take measures we have to know the issues and also the target and also the methodology that we are using in dealing with and helping those nations that are facing food shortages. We are having a surplus of 10.2 million tons of rice. Our president has prepared an adequate reserve for certain countries to help them, including African countries. The point is, whenever a country has a surplus or has been able to exceed the national needs, they should plan for using the access they have for global interest. Therefore, to me, the global cooperation should be enhanced so that it is not a rhetoric only, 
but how to monitor follow-up actions in the level of implementation in fulfilling the needs. Therefore, our strategy in Indonesia, we need to look at regions having emergency needs, including countries having conflicts, yeah, like happening between Russia and Ukraine. What is our step? Are there any temporary measures? In Indonesia, we have prepared two years yeah, to prepare ourselves in the event of issues. We are the fourth largest country after China, India, and the US, followed by Pakistan. Therefore, we need to ensure that in, for example, the past two years, we didn't have any acute food shortage issues. Then, cooperation for a permanent system indicates that food security becomes important and there shall be no countries harming the trade ecosystem which we have built so far. I think that's all. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I, I know that there'll be um, many countries studying what Indonesia is doing. And we're going to come back with some follow-up questions on that uh, shortly. Now, I'd like to turn uh, to Dr. Meyer, who's um, uh, with us on the screen. And um, Dr. Meyer, I've been bragging at this conference about some of the U.S. innovations in agriculture, and especially about improvements in things like um, uh, bushels per acre of corn, and um, also talking about the role of um, agricultural extension services that the various states have and, and, the, uh, and the Department of Agriculture. So uh, when you look at the food security issue in the world, how do you see, what do you see as the, the, the right things for the United States to do? What would you be recommending uh, right now if, uh, if we could put you in front of the G20 in person and have them, all those heads of state lined up and you'd be able to tell them, one, two, three, I want this done. What would you uh, tell them? Yeah, so, so I think the, the, the first place is to start uh, uh, is yeah, the U.S., we've been uh, incredibly productive in terms of growth in U.S. agricultural production. You know, when I look to say, you know, what should we be doing around the world? When we look at the application of technology in the United States and what we've done to improve productivity, uh, I think we take this, you know, from a, a three-point approach in the United States now, which is, you know, we want not just to execute and pull every single uh, bushel out of every acre if that's not environmentally sustainable. Or we don't want to apply technologies or, or activities which don't make producers money. So again, you know, we think about this in terms of uh, uh, sustainable productivity growth in the United States. It's got to make money for the farmer. It's got to produce food that is affordable for consumers. It's got to be environmentally sustainable. This isn't something that you can produce for a few years and then you do damage to your system or to the climate and you can't continue to produce. So, you know, I think the U.S. sees itself as being a reliable producer on the global market. Um, we, you know, one of my other hats that I'll put on here quick is the G20 as an initiative of the Ag Market Information Systems and one of the, Amos, one of the principles of Amos is, you know, providing market information and avoiding unnecessary disruptions in the global market. So when I say the U.S. being a reliable supplier, part of that is not putting export controls on. Part of that's not putting export controls on, being a reliable supplier and providing it to the rest of the world. And in the U.S., you know, when we take our look at technology and sustainable productivity gains in the United States, there's also a big interest in the United States in sharing that technology, sharing the adaptation practices from our climate hubs in the United States and taking that internationally. The Secretary of Agriculture mentioned that at COP27 today. Um, so, so taking the lessons we've learned, you're right about our domestic extension service, but we're pushing that to the next level. We're pushing that into our climate smart commodities programs where we're going to, you know, we put in $3 billion to experiment how to produce commodities in an environmentally friendly way that producers can extract money and, and, and income from, and yet meets the demands that the consumers want for these sustainable goods. So, um, you know, what's our principle in the United States? I think it's to be, continue to be productive, to be productive in a sustainable way, 
and to share all those experiences about how we've done it with the rest of the world as well too because we can do lots of things in the united states but we're not going to achieve this goal of global food security without sharing this information which is very specific to countries own situation so we'll share our experiences with the rest of the world i think that's how we do it well, thank you very much dr Marin. we we got a couple of follow-up questions for you here if we've got time on some of the specific technologies we're doing on carbon sequestration and other things and um and maybe even on intellectual property so um at this point i'd like to turn to uh, ambassador david merrill former ambassador here in indonesia and uh, David, you must be really um, impressed by the progress Indonesia has made. It's remarkable in your time and experience here. But um, I want to ask you, we haven't talked that much about international institutions. That's right. So when you think about, as we're looking at the G20 here, and we've, uh, we've got uh, the minister's experience in Indonesia. Sure. We've got uh, the immediate guidance from um, the... Uh, member of parliament in Ukraine. Uh, we've got uh, the willingness of the United States to share. But what about these international organizations sure. like FAO and World Food Program? And are they really tuned up to help us move forward? Or yes. do we need to do more with them? Yes, General Clark, thanks for that question. Um, I just am struck by the poignancy of this moment. I mean, here we are sitting in Bali just ahead of the G20. Uh, we are mainly NGOs, we are some government officials. Um, we don't know what form the G20 communique or statement or any other document on food security will take. At least I don't know. I don't think any of us know. Uh, but we have an obligation to use the NGO channel to address the G20 and give them our ideas. Um, now, one of them is on what international institutions can do. Um, there are the MDBs, the World Food Program, the FAO, that even the WTO, USAID has done a lot of work over years, other government uh, aid agencies have done a lot. So they can work on national and so, uh, local distribution schemes. They can work on internationally coordinated food emergency reserves, which I haven't heard being done yet. Uh, they can work with NGOs and private charities. The idea is, to, as you have said, to coordinate the mobilization of adequate finance, uh, repurpose there's about $800 billion a year of agricultural support going through multilateral and bilateral agencies, maybe just multilateral alone. That can be taken a look at. It can be repurposed for the needs of this particular food crisis. Balance of payments and budget support, debt relief, adequate IFI financing, even expanded, emergency food reserves. So that's one. Um, and we want to refrain from trade restrictions on fertilizer trade. That would make things worse. Um, we want to guarantee the affordable supplies of staple foods, physical supplies, access via trade, access via income, and livelihood support, social protection programs, and uh, I'll wind up with a later a possible G20 forum for food security dialogue that would continue after the current G20. It doesn't have to be another international institution. It can be a place for things related to food security to be discussed under the aegis, perhaps, of Indonesia. The... Um, Improving supplies and distribution of fertilizers is key. Um, there are trade barriers. There are subsidy schemes that have to be revisited. Um, redoubled efforts to improve the efficiency of fertilizer use to help farmers do more with less. 
to save costs, to reduce nutrient loss to the environment. There needs to be improved productivity of small, small holders growing staple food crops, closing the yield gaps. Uh, there's a gentleman from Israel here who's using micro water injections to improve uh, food productivity. It doesn't even have to be fertilizer. It can be fertilizer plus no fertilizer technology. Um, so the resilience and sustainability of food production, there's a lot that can be done. And as General Prabowo said, um, and as the Chinese say, out of crisis comes opportunity. So here's a, a dilly of a crisis, but it's also a big opportunity. And we can even change the, the, the world, make at least some changes in the world system for dealing with this as a result of this crisis. Improving, improving the nutritional quality of diets, programs for women and children, uh, increased use of micronutrients. <coughs> From, what about agricultural research? Uh, we've been doing that for 40 years. Taking a look at the agricultural research that's being done, see what improvements can be made, make crops more resilient to climate change, more sustainable, higher yields on less land. Now, um, it wasn't too long ago, it was only in April or maybe March, that the G20 itself was grappling with, did it even need to be concerned with the Ukraine food crisis? They said, hey, this is a political crisis. This is for other agencies of the UN. And most of us went around saying, no, this is an economic crisis. OK, it started with politics. It started with war. But if people are starving to death, isn't that a concern of the G20? Fortunately, it took only about two, three weeks for the G20 to say, that's exactly right. So the G20 can make equally impressive leaps in the next couple of weeks and years. Now, the one thing that we have uh, talked about is the creation of a G20 forum for food security, trying to bypass uh, the resistance that we would encounter if we're setting up yet another international institution. Don't need to. Indonesia is in a great position because of its posture on the world stage and because it's leading the G20 to sort of serve as, uh, I don't want to say clearinghouse necessarily, but a forum for discussion of ideas on food security. And Indonesia has a very good track record on food security. If you go back to 2008, there was a, a severe rice crisis. And Indonesia was one of the primary, probably the primary leader on solving the, the regional and, and global rice crisis in 2008. Indonesia is going to be chairing ASEAN. So let's let Indonesia within ASEAN at least deal with the rice part of food security, which it's already shown it can do a good job. So in sum, um, I think we should write up the recommendations of this conference in some form with some people designated and get them post haste to the people in the G20 that are deciding whether to have some kind of statement and what that statement should be. It's the least we can do to make our input. That's my suggestion. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador. Those are some really great ideas, and we'll try to incorporate them. OK, so we've got about uh, 10 minutes. I'm going to try to do a couple of, let's call them, lightning rounds. And then I'm going to come back to the minister to ask another follow-up question. So the first lightning round, I want to ask uh, each of our panelists this question. When we look at classical economics, we talk about land, labor, and capital. And um, in agriculture, of course, there's agricultural land, there's the farm labor, 
There's the mechanization of labor, which has helped us tremendously. Uh, but capital, the world is awash in capital. We had no idea 50 years ago that capital would be so plentiful in the world. What can capital do? Financial firms, um, investment firms, firms that want to talk about um, how to improve mankind. I deal with these firms in London all the time. I hear it in New York. Um, what is our specific ask of the financial community in dealing with this world food crisis? And I'd like to start and ask, um, I mean, you, don't, you may not have an answer to this, but, um, but if you do, I'd like, I'd like you to, th to, to, to come up and, and tell me what you think about it. And let's talk about the Ukraine crisis first. What can the international capital leaders do? They've got billions of dollars of resources. What are they going to do with it to help us right now in Ukraine? First of all, to secure the investments um, into agriculture for the next year. You, uh, I think all of us, we realize that generally there has been a huge flow back of the investment into Ukraine. And this is understandable because of the war. So. Uh, we need that to come back. On all the investment forums, with all the investors, bankers, we are saying, uh, we all remember the lessons of the war. The one who is coming first will get the big, the big buck. And so this is why it's time to invest right now. The risks are high, but the output will also be extremely high. This is how fortunes are made. So this is why... Uh, if the argument of the risks and the, the output would not work, we will just ask, saying, do it as a humanitarian way. Invest into uh, Ukraine right now, into agricultural sector. Uh, then we are coming back again to, uh, to cleaning up the mines, because this is, the demining efforts are critical right now and will require tremendous investment. Just for everyone to understand, demining is basically going through every field and checking and um, processing the certain level of uh, the ground. So it's, it's just like another agricultural work, basically, and it's uh, an incredibly important and hard and complicated process that needs to happen, but it, the output of it will be extremely productive because it will give us back the very fertile land. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in. I'm going to say I've got two suggestions, okay? And you tell me if you like them, you take them back to Ukraine. We'll go to Dr. Meyer, and he'll push them through U.S. Department of Agriculture and get them up there. One is farmers in Iowa have done amazing things with putting tile underneath their farmland. They have rich, deep, dark earth, just like uh, Ukraine does. It promotes drainage, so you can get into the land sooner, you can take out the pockets that hold water, you can have uniform crop. Suppose we gave Ukrainian farmers no interest loans to improve their land in that way so that they would get more productivity per hectare. Number two, there's been a lot of destruction and theft of agricultural equipment in Ukraine. Suppose Ukrainian farmers got no interest loans to replace that agricultural equipment. Would that be helpful? If you yes. like that? I do like that. Okay, well, good. It's a fantastic Dr. Question. Marr, can we do that? Well, uh, in, in, and we're already doing some of that when it All comes right. to U.S. government support for farmers. So, so I'll even take a step back. My, Iranian, uh, my Ukrainian colleagues talking about, um, about infrastructure and delivery of grain. I'll even take a step back and say, we're, we're figuring out ways to try and help the agricultural producers to be able to afford simple things like cash flow, getting that crop planted, getting the crop stored as they work on their infrastructure. So things like temporary storage, the big silo bags. So instead of having a large barn, you have a very long, long, long uh, plastic tube, essentially, where you're storing grain sure. temporarily. I think there are things that need to be done on the ground in Ukraine now for these producers to cash flow for this next crop. Put that okay. wheat in the winter wheat in the ground or plant spring crop. That sounds good. Remember, I'm focusing on finance. Put the money in. Get the farmers the money they need at no interest loans so they can improve productivity. 
Now let me turn to the minister. Sir, I want to ask you this question. I know you've had a lot of um, foreign direct investment in agriculture in Indonesia, these palm oil plantations and other things, but um, what more can the international financial community do to promote sustainable agriculture in Indonesia? What can we do to, what do we need to advertise? And you're the pace setter for so many tropical environments. What do we need the bankers in London and New York to know about your needs for finance? Agriculture does not only concern food. It also involves employment and a fundamental economic system to support industries including pharmaceuticals industries. So, when it comes to agriculture, there are opportunities for investment in the agricultural cultivation stage, as well as post-harvest. And there are also opportunities in agricultural industries. And the third one is the marketing of agricultural products. So there are three agendas, three segments, which can be tapped into in investment. And we, upon the order of our president, are working on this. Agriculture must be the answer. And this year, after three years, since Indonesia's cult agriculture has been the mainstay of the Indonesian economy, other sectors have been hit hard by COVID, but our agriculture went up by 16.42%. Our global exports rose to 38.2%. And this is a sign that agriculture has not been much affected by the conditions and weather except for war, because we need fertilizers. Sodium and phosphate fertilizers are in Ukraine and Russia. And this is a challenge for the whole world. Therefore, where is the investment? The investment can be made in the three areas general. And talking about agriculture, we are a tropical country consisting of 17,000 islands. There are areas which can be invested for this in coastal and marine areas. And there are already investments that can be made. We produce a lot of tuna, up to 18 million tons a year. We can grow crops on the coastal areas as well with the technology that was presented by our American colleague. We have crops that are resilient against water-related challenges, can survive in swamps and can survive in salty seawater. Indonesia has many hills and mountains, and we still have enough land available to invest. Currently, the President of Indonesia, Mr. Joko Widodo, is trying to focus several areas to be made into food estates called integrated farms where the large land consists of plantations, animal husbandry, and even fresh water fish cultivation, as well as horticulture. All of this requires technology, requires experts, and requires machines in order to become a product that the world needs. Therefore, agricultural products after reaching the industrial stage will be part that we are waiting for. We have enough land for sugar factories. We have sugar in Indonesia in large quantities, but we still import some of it, so which bank is willing to invest? Finally, agriculture needs capital, and this is one of President Jokowi's successes in preparing a large enough budget to be accessed by small farmers in the form of people's business loans. Its value is approximately 100 trillion. 
Our farmers two years ago used these funds around 55 trillion. The NPL was only 0.03%. Our farmers are honest and don't want to be in debt. Last year, we used 85 trillion people's business credit funds based on government policies. It is not a subsidy, but a loan with low interest. With low interest, this can be good working capital to use. And the NPL is 0.6%, and that is in agricultural cultivation stage. Now in post-harvest, it's on how micro, small, and medium enterprises can access agriculture loans. Therefore, finally, there are five points that has become our focus from these investment funds. First, to encourage the opening and creation of agricultural businesses, both small, medium, and large investments. I've given the example of sugar. We have sagu palms in an area of 5 million hectares, and this can be used as flour, which can substitute wheat. If there is a bank that wants to invest, we will show you the place. Second, we support young entrepreneurs to become millennial farmers in agriculture. We focus on giving access to young farmers who want to try. We have trained more than 300 farmers using people's business credit funds of approximately 2 trillion rupees. The acceleration is very fast because the younger ones have a faster network, strong motivation, and WhatsApp groups, and this works quite well. Third, provide assistance for agricultural businesses for export. For exports, we assist them. Therefore, we bridge between buyers from one country and buyers from other countries. And the G20 must be able to bridge the assistance from the United States and what we can facilitate with the current conditions, conducting training and assistance in the development of agricultural businesses requires experts. Even an entrepreneurial system is needed for our agriculture because our agriculture involves global matters. Our CPO production is large, our oil production is also large, but does everything have to be with big industries? Now the president wants this to be done by people's industry, and this requires capital to be facilitated so that the products can be exported to the global market at a lower price. Then, of course, we enhance our national products so that they stay competitive compared to those of other countries. I think agriculture is the answer to the global crisis and the world economic crisis in the future. If we can maintain our agriculture properly, it will be very much helpful as everyone needs agriculture. Thank you. Great lessons. Great lessons. That's great. So look, um, we're trying to do a lightning round here, and um, I'm going to get struck by lightning if I don't move this thing along. So I'd like to open up this next question to anybody who wants to do it. But if in the military, we always have dreams about what technology we might have in the future. You know, we've always thought better communications of higher resolution imagery, those kinds of things. If you're in the thinking about the food problem in the world, what do we need to think about in the way of technology? What's the what's the opportunity that we just need to put the resources on to really move us forward to the next level? How do we do it? Anybody who wants to take it, David, Seth, um, you want to take it here from the? What, what do you say from the United States about it's, it? It's a combination of international institutions and the private sector. Uh, I believe there still is an international institute on wheat research. I think it's called CIMIT. I have no idea what it's been doing, but it better be doing something right now. So that's one. 
The other was the idea that uh, Minister Prabhu said about getting private investment started. He's doing a good job, so are others. Um, and I think that's equally worthy, if not more worthy, than the government programs. Dr. Maher, what do you say? If you could have your silver bullet here to fix this, what would it be? I think it'd be two very different things. So for a, on the pure science and technology side, we're making huge advancements in things like gene editing. So taking genes within the plant, not introducing new genes, just turning things off and on or, or letting the plant express uh, genes which are already there. So impressive technology uh, to, to help us do more with less. You know, ways to avoid putting, you know, rationalize better things like fertilizer use, which is both good for producers in terms of lowering cost and good for the environment. But then I think that there's some other, you know, not cutting edge science that really has uh, potential for food security. And that is translating a lot of this technology and practices, some of them used by U.S. producers, into small smallholder farms. Or even let's talk about the ability of women to gain capital and their productivity gaps and and even steps here where we could bring uh you know women make them as productive and it's not because they're not productive it's access to capital and technology there's a huge gap that could help us close in productivity simply providing technology and capital to women farmers would do a tremendous amount for food security. So I think we've got amazing science we can apply, but we got to bring that science down to producers to fix those uh, productivity gaps around the world. Well, thank you. Now, look, here's what we've done in the last 35 or 40 minutes up here. We've looked at the immediate crisis in Ukraine. We've come up with some concrete suggestions that have to be done right away. We've taken Indonesia as the example of a tropical country that has done marvelous work and has so many lessons to share with the world, and we congratulate Indonesia for this. We've listed the international institutions and a number of changes that can be made. We've talked about international finance. We've talked about the future of technology and the role of the United States still as a leading agricultural country to develop that technology, share it, and push it out. I think it's a, it's, this is a time to come out of the crisis and look to the future with hope. Thank you all. Let's give our panel a big hand here. Thank you. Thank you, General. Thank you, General. But I need him to come to Indonesia. Yeah, yeah you need, to come to, to come to Indonesia. come to Indonesia. Seth, you come to Indonesia, okay? <laughs> Next week. <laughs> Next week. Thank you all. Thank you.